Chapter 20. The End or Is It a Prequel? As I finish A State of Fear, it is one year since Fright Night, when our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, told us that the coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. All over the world we are seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. From this evening I must give the British people a very simple instruction, you must stay at home. The past year will have meant many different things to many different people. Your experience will have colored your view of an extraordinary year. It was a year of death and illness, from COVID and also illnesses which lost out in priority, one way or another, to COVID. It was a year of more contentment for some, as they evaded the rat race, life became simpler, they spent more time with family. It was a year of separation, loneliness and hardship for others. It was a year of liberties lost. It was a year of fear. Some fears we relish and return to, the scariest roller coaster or the made you jump the most times horror film. I think once this debacle is over, people will want to forget the worst and romanticize the best, to storify the saga into a bearable memory. But that would be dangerous. We must use the emotional distance and space to critically assess which Rubicons were crossed. When I started investigating this book, the idea that our fear had been weaponized against us was not popular currency, but is now starting to circulate. At the time of this strange anniversary, a Guardian front page headline read, COVID checks at pubs could nudge young people to get vaccine, explicitly noting the blatant use of behavioral psychology. In the same week, Professor Tim Spector told Times Radio that the Prime Minister's warnings of a third wave were designed to keep the population fearful. Variants are now often referred to as scariants, in an acknowledgement of increasingly obvious attempts to scare the British public into complying with the rules. Although the vaccine program has been successful in its aims, and cases, hospitalizations and deaths are falling, the campaign of fear continues. More punitive fines are dangled like threatening bombs, most lately a £5,000 fine should you dare to take an overseas holiday. We have been warned that restrictions will not be eased if we break the rules. A government minister urged the public to call out friends and family for hugging. In the spring of 2021, a poster in a park in Bromley proclaimed, COVID-19 is in this park and is now easier to catch, in black, yellow and red fonts and chevrons, which warn of danger. And the doom-mongering headlines continue at home and abroad. Bloomberg proclaimed, we must start planning for a permanent pandemic, with coronavirus mutations pitted against vaccinations in a global arms race, we may never go back to normal. Yet there are also cracks in the campaign of fear. Young people didn't seem frightened as they crowded into parks around the country on the 29th of March 2021 when restrictions eased, basking in sunshine and the sociality of groups of six. Spring worked its magic on a seasonal virus and on the soul. Despite the best efforts of the fear machine, I have some hope. Fear is not sustainable. And, as it wears thin, it is revealed to be in an inverse relationship with the growing awareness of how it was weaponized. As fear finally melts away we will be able to confront our frailties and strengths, as citizens, scientists, journalists and politicians. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt said in his inaugural address in 1933 that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He had a positive vision of a future where fear would be put in its place by a society that believed in itself. These days, politicians are far more likely to advise the public to fear everything, including fear itself. But we can ask for better. From them, the media, the unelected psychocrats and from ourselves. People do not want to live in a state of fear and they do not want to be manipulated. I think the handling of the epidemic should teach us to be wary, if not frightened, of Bernays' invisible government, which nudges and forces behavior change through manipulating our emotions. It is the duty of us all to think about what type of society we want to live in, which values we treasure, the styles of governance we approve of and reject, and what constitutional protections we may wish to introduce. It is ironic that in recent years, governments around the world have started to consider frameworks of well-being, yet they launched campaigns to frighten their populations to implement lockdowns. Although one sounds friendlier than the other, be aware that both frameworks see our emotions as the province of the state. When I spoke to Steve Baker MP in the summer of 2020 he offered some thought-provoking G comments about how to envisage society. I think we need a deep conversation about values and how we want to become. At the moment authoritarian collectivist values are being used. 
I would dearly love to see politicians of all parties learn from what has gone on during this crisis and say, let us not return to that dystopia, let us choose to be greater and commit to liberal and tolerant values. Normally everyone would say they subscribe to that. Gavin Morgan pragmatically told me, we are always being manipulated whether we are aware of it or not. Politicians try to be good at this manipulation and often have the media on their side to promote a certain narrative, this then becomes how we think and respond. It goes unchallenged, which is why ethical psychology needs to be a positive influence in society. We have a moral imperative and a responsibility to say when we know something is wrong and damage is being done. There is a responsibility for psychology to take a lead role in shaping a better future. We don't know what this will look like, it needs to be shaped by us all. Co-constructed by the nation. It is hopeful that there are psychologists who want to co-construct. That is a far cry from the psychocrats who see themselves as the architects of our emotions and behavior. Some advisors close to government have held our emotional happiness and freedoms a little less dearly than we do ourselves. When he described the inception of the UK's lockdown and the comparison with China, Professor Neil Ferguson said, it's a communist one-party state, we said. We couldn't get away with it in Europe, we thought. And then Italy did it. And we realized we could. We could get away with it, is a very revealing way to put it. Having got away with it once, is the government likely to inflict an authoritarian measure like lockdown again? And would they rely on our learned obedience, our muscle memory, or would they use fear again? Without the strongest objections from all of us, an inquiry and resistance against these tools, I think their future and repeated use inevitable. The COVID-19 epidemic may prove to be the biggest campaign of fear the UK, and the world, has ever seen. I'm not sure we even needed it. Fear was an open door, naturally, because we were in an epidemic. The government didn't need to so much as knock on the door. It didn't have to open it for us, and politely say, after you. It certainly didn't need to use a battering ram. The almost imperceptible stripping away of rights and freedoms, as the people and the government gradually separate, is an old story repeated throughout history, but avoidable if we choose to learn from it. A German professor recounted the process, movingly, in They Thought They Were Free, by Milton Mayer. To live in this process is absolutely not to be able to notice it. Please try to believe me. Unless one has a much greater degree of political awareness, acuity, than most of us had ever had occasion to develop. Each step was so small, so inconsequential, so well explained or, on occasion, regretted, that, unless one were detached from the whole process from the beginning, unless one understood what the whole thing was in principle, what all these, little measures, that no, patriotic German, could resent must someday lead to, one no more saw it developing from day to day than a farmer in his field sees the corn growing. One day it is over his head. How far has the corn grown? It is known that fear induces a desire for authoritarian control. Here in the UK, one of the cradles of democracy, fear has created the right emotional temperature for the toleration, even enthusiastic welcome, of increased surveillance, reduced rights to protest, and breaches of human rights. The policies of the last year affected our daily lives, weakened our social bonds, and also disrupted the most intimate human rights of birth, marriage and death. We need to be cautious about policies of fear which invade our humanity. We mustn't let a medical crisis strip us of our freedoms or our ideals. In the introduction I said I wanted to invite you to write the end of the story. The textbook of tyrants is written in the language of coercion and cajolement. And sadly there is no mythic happy ever after. But you know that. The truth is that we live in a permanent prequel, as the story always goes on. The way to change the story is simply to believe in our power to change it. We seem to have forgotten that no one is safe. You have never been safe and you never will be. Nor will I in the blind global panic of an epidemic we have forgotten how to analyze risk. If you don't accept that you will die one day, that you can never be safe, then you are a sitting duck for authoritarian policies which purport to be for your safety. If too many individuals immolate their libert. Why for safety? we risk a bonfire of freedoms. Nudge undermines free will. It removes our choices without us even knowing. If we continue to allow ourselves to be nudged towards a greater good, we have given up on determining what good looks like. The weaponization of fear undermines democracy, liberty and humanity. Nudge is not fair play. The use of behavioral psychology and specifically the weaponization of fear were symptoms of a government that had given up on trust and transparency. 
If we truly believe in freedom we must also believe we deserve it. Personal responsibility is not a conduit to danger. Let us reject living in a state of fear. As we recover from an epidemic, we must also recover the trust and transparency that we deserve.